Well, glad you're here. Thankful that we could be together again. It truly is a privilege to be able to come together with God's people and study the Word. You know, we do think back on the year that's gone by and the opportunities that we've had. When we started out in January, we weren't promised that we were going to have a full year of time together, a full year of Lord's Days. Of course, there have been some days when people have had to miss and been hindered from coming. Times we may have been traveling and be with brethren in other places. But it's good to be here, and I'm grateful for your presence, and I hope and pray that this time will be uh, of use to you. Uh, we've been looking at the book of 1 Corinthians in a study that's been often interrupted, but that's all right. Joel, I think this thing is out of batteries. I see a red light here. So, anyway, I'm not sure if we have any more of these or not. But um, 1 Corinthians is, uh, is a really challenging book. And uh, I think uh, it, it's certainly a book that contains a number of passages that are um, uh, controversial in many ways. Uh, they are uh, uh, passages about which much debate has taken place. And certainly the subject tonight and the lesson tonight will not be uh, an exception to that. Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and we've seen in the first six chapters um, already in the, uh, much material. But beginning in chapter 7, students recognize that we have now a different phase in the letter uh, he begins here in verse 1 with the words, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me. Um, and, and, and as you read the book, you'll notice that is a reoccurring phrase uh, in chapter 7 and verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no command except uh, of the Lord. Uh, or in 8.1, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. Uh, or in, uh, in 12 in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts. Or in 16 in verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. And I think these phrases indicate to us that Paul is in the material that, that follows answering a question that uh, has come his way, perhaps through the house of Chloe. You know, he had gotten that report from the house of Chloe. And so we begin looking at a series of questions. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, we begin looking at a series of questions. And the question that we're dealing with uh, tonight in, in what we call chapter 7 is the question, uh, will marriage help or hinder my serving Christ? And he's going to look at several specifics uh, that really revolve around that question. In the first nine verses, he's going to be dealing with the question, what about married, unmarried people and, and, and widows? And then in the next section, 11, 10 and 11, he'll be talking about folks already married. What should they do? How does, uh, do these concerns affect them? Uh, should they put away their partner, for example, uh, in order to get closer to God? Uh, what about those who are married to unbelievers? He'll deal with and address that subject in specific. Uh, he'll have a section here where he's talking about these things and he will bring up the fact that uh, the, the basic message is to abide in the calling wherewith we are called. And we'll talk about that. And how that the present distress has an impact on his answer in all of these situations. And then he'll talk finally at the end of the book about virgin daughters uh, and uh, widows in particular. And how what he's saying might impact them in a specific way. But let's start out, if you have your Bible, uh, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and the first nine verses. I'm reading from the old translation here, where he writes, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. And let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but 
the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, the one after this matter, the other after that. I say therefore unto the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. So with those words, Paul begins this, uh, this section. Uh, he talks about a way that is good. And the good way involves in verse one the idea not to have sexual relations with women, or as one translation would put it, uh, not to marry. Of course, marriage being the only legitimate way in which people might have sexual relations with their lawful spouse. And so what Paul is saying is, I am a bachelor, I'm celibate, and I find this to be uh, the best way to live at this time. But he makes it clear he is not prohibiting marriage. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, this is verse 2 in the ESV, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Uh, you know, this makes it plain that he is not prohibiting marriage in general terms. It also, by the way, uh, makes it pretty plain that God's plan is monogamy. Don't you find that to be true? You know, polygamy was uh, not uncommon uh, in the ancient world. And by the way, it's not unheard of in our world. We tend to think of that big uh, relic of some ancient historical time. Actually, there are places in the world today where people have uh, more than one wife. But he makes it clear that God's plan is for a man to have his own wife and a woman her own husband. Two shall be one. That's God's plan. There have been allowances made, but, but God's will was always clear. And under the New Testament, there is no authority for any other relationship than a monogamous lawful marriage. Verse 3, he says, Render due benevolence that for some marriage seems to be almost a necessity. And, and to render in that relationship, the old translation says, due benevolence. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, uh, rare uh, expression. Uh, and it's pretty clear that it's used euphemistically for marital sex or conjugal duty, as one uh, fellow put it. Um, I like the, the old CEV, the paraphrase, where he, he presents this teaching in these words, husbands and wives should be fair with each other about having sex. And I think that's probably a pretty good description of, of what he's calling them to do. And he does that in part to avoid fornication. Uh, in order to avoid the risk and the dangers involved, let a woman not neglect the husband's needs or the husband, his wife's needs within the marriage relationship, a lawful marriage relationship. He goes on in the, uh, the, the modern translation. In verse 4, a wife does not have authority over her own body, power, exercise authority over her own body, but the husband does. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not withhold yourselves from each other unless you agree to do so for a set time in order to devote yourselves to prayer. And then you should come together again so that Satan does not tempt you through your lack of self-control. So he's calling on a couple here to be conscious of the needs of their partner and also of the danger of the devil getting involved in a, in a situation where he will cause problems. Uh, that's not always the reason why sexual sin takes place, surely. But it can be a factor. He says it must not be. And there's that generosity of spirit 
that, uh, that both a husband and a wife need, Paul said, in, in, in order to avoid this problem. Now, in, in verse 6, Paul writes, I, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, the one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. It is better to marry than to burn. Again, Paul is not giving a general prohibition against marriage. Uh, the scriptures, I think, make plain God's attitude about marriage as being a positive thing. Uh, we, we, we remember Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 as one example. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Or Proverbs 18 and verse 22. The one who has found a good wife has found what goodness is and obtained a delightful gift from the Lord. You know, marriage is God's creation. And it's, I think, in general terms, a blessing. And Paul recognized that. He wasn't denying that. Uh, there are a lot of good things that come from the marriage relationship. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, in, in writing to Timothy later on in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, warned Timothy that the Spirit expressly says in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, having speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You know, when I was first reading the Bible, I heard a lot of people point out that, um, that the, uh, the Catholic Church, a very prominent denomination, uh, had as a part of their, uh, of their law and their uh, polity had uh, ruled out marriage for anyone who would serve, for example, as a priest or in the hierarchy of the church in that way. And uh, the connection was made there. You know, Paul warned these people to come along and forbid marriage. I, I, marriage, I actually think that applies, but uh, they're part of the only ones who do that. And through the years, there have been various groups and cults who have suggested marriage was an evil thing or a bad thing, uh, whether or not it might be for, for an individual, it's certainly not something that would be generally forbidden. And Paul is not doing that. He, he wrote these words. He recognizes that marriage is a gift and a positive thing. But in his work, he had uh, foregone the, the right to marry. He wrote about that in Corinthians, in fact. We'll get to that shortly. You know, he, he had a right to lead about a sister, a wife. But uh, he, had, he had forsaken that privilege in order to do a work. Uh, and he calls on brethren here to ask themselves the question, will it be better for you, will it make it easier for you to go to heaven or harder if in the circumstance they were in, they would, uh, not, uh, uh, they would choose to marry or to not marry? Uh, it, it's, it's what he calls uh, an advice, an instruction. Uh, I give my judgment, he writes along that line. Uh, but I think this is not merely advice. I think that the principles here are inspired principles. The last verse of this chapter, as we divide the, 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 the book into chapters, uh, Paul writes, uh, but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And then he writes, and I think I have the spirit of God. When you read this chapter, people are sometimes taken aback by Paul's language. Uh, and uh, they say, well, 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 why would Paul write and say this is not a commandment? I mean, isn't the Bible supposed to be rules and not just suggestions? Well, this is not just a mere suggestion. Uh, I, I think it's good advice, but Paul does not take it to the level of an absolute law and legislate you must not marry for the reasons that he gives. For some people, that would lead them further away from God, not closer. But for others, it will certainly be a factor that might harm them spiritually. Why? Well, 
Verse 26, and we'll talk about this more, I hope, in just a second. But he says, I suppose it good, we might as well skip ahead here for a moment. I suppose it good for the present distress, I say it is good for a man's soul to be. And I'll just tell you, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what that was. Uh, I don't really know that I've ever read anybody else who knew exactly what it was, but I think it's not hard to understand that it had something to do with some type of persecution or trial upon Christians. Uh, and, and that seems evident. What, what the specific thing he might have been thinking about, or if it was just one thing, I'm not sure. But there were circumstances there, hard times that were coming or already being seen. And Paul said, let me tell you, it's going to be easier for you not to be married during these times than it will be to care for a family, for a wife or for a husband. Well, why would that be so? Well, we'll talk about that more when we get down to verses uh, 32 and following. But, but the, the short answer to that is because when you take on the responsibility of a family, you certainly bring a lot of joy but also a lot of care and concern. Imagine yourself if uh, for whatever reasons we might fall under uh, the persecution of a government. Not that hard to imagine anymore. But suppose that was so that they were rounding up and threatening with jail or even with torture those who would confess to be Christians. Well, it's one thing for you to deal with that as an individual. But another thing, if you're an individual who has a wife and has children, so I don't think it's that hard to understand where Paul is coming from, is it? And Paul is saying, I'm giving you this advice as one who has the Spirit of God. This comes from God. He's not saying, do not marry but he is saying you need to be careful. You need to think carefully, not just about can you be a good husband, but can you handle such responsibilities with this dark cloud coming? That, I think, is the point that he's making. But he also, in this passage, makes it plain that for some people, uh, the choice is either to marry or to burn. <laughs> and I don't think he's talking about hell there. I don't think he is. I think he's talking here about the idea of burning in lust, which would lead to eternal destruction if it's not repented of. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, beginning at verse 27. We remember these famous words of the Lord, you've heard about not committing adultery, but I say to you, whosoever looks on a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is a rather specific statement, but I think there's a general condemnation, not just of lusting after some woman who's uh, married or some, maybe you're married, but the idea of a lust that would, uh, wh whoever you are and wherever it's directed, that would lead uh, to sin and separation from God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 would be one example of that. Put to death whatever in your nature belongs to the earth. Sexual immorality, impurity, shameful passion, evil design, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. You know, I'll offer this as a thought. Again, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take Paul's language here. I'll offer this for consideration, and I'm not trying to make a law where God has it. But you know, I, I've, I've come to, to recognize that in this verse you have some things said about long engagements and about putting off marriage. Some people can handle that and some people handle it very well and some people have wisdom in what they do there. But it's also a fact that God intended for most people uh, to marry. And uh, one of the, the things that is... Uh, uh, different now than it was in days gone by. You know, it's, it's shocking, it's amazing to think about how some of our grandparents, at least if you're my age, grandparents, uh, married some of them at an extremely young age. And, um, you know, you think, don't tell my kids that you got married at that age. But, of course, the other side of that coin, as you know, is that, yeah, but those people were also people who were working and making a living at a very young age. 
and uh, young women who learned how to run a household at a very young age. They matured at a younger age. And uh, when they married, they weren't little kids, even though they were quite young to us. Uh, and they still had a lot to learn, but they also had learned a lot. And I, I say all that to say, you know, for young people who are uh, bombarded with hormonal changes and are growing up, uh, it's one thing for them to wait a few years, but it's another thing for them to wait 20 years. Oh, don't worry about marriage until you get... Well, there are a lot of things that involve themselves in, in questions like that. When to marry? And I don't have all the answers. Paul didn't try to give all the answers. He just said, you need to consider in the question of whether or not to marry, how is this affecting your soul? And, and what he said is, if you find out that marrying is going to make it harder for you to go to heaven, don't marry. We're not even thinking right now about people who have no right to marry because of maybe some choices. That, we're not even thinking about that. We're talking about people who are eligible to marry. But he said for others who are eligible to marry, and they say, well, I'm just going to just do some things, take some time and whatever, and make some money, and then one of these days I'll get married. Okay. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot better to marry than to burn. So that's a practical point that still resonates, I believe. Uh, and uh, Paul talks about some people have a, a gift and have developed a certain level of, of self-control and others struggle in that regard. So be careful and make sure that the choices you make are not only lawful but wise and wise to you personally. You may have some questions further about that and please do feel free to talk to me about it. Um, if, if I've missed the point, you can help me. Let's, let's continue reading here in the 10th verse because now he looks specifically at those already married and what choices should they make? If marriage is going to make it harder to go to God during the present distress, maybe I need to get out of this thing. Paul speaks plainly to that point. He says, under the married I command... Not advice, but commanding. Yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled unto her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Now the words like put away and depart, we need to read into that the idea of a separation from a wife involving a divorce from them. We're no longer going to serve as their husband or their wife. We're going to put them away, divorce them, send them away, separate from them, divide. Now, you'll note this, that in what Paul said, he applies this equally, both ways, just as the Lord did with the marriage law. He didn't just give the marriage law to the husband and the wife just has no say. The wife also uh, has an equal responsibility to act lawfully, uh, and to be committed to a relationship. So the husband and the wife are both commanded not to depart from their lawful spouse. That takes us back, as Paul said, to the words of the Lord. The Lord's already addressed this specifically. What's he talking about there? Go back to Matthew 19. In Matthew 19 and in verse 3, we've got the, uh, the new King James up here on the chart. Matthew 19, verse 3, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who has made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. There's a union between these two. Uh, it, it's symbolized in, in, in conjugal law, but it, it's certainly more than that. It's the idea of two now becoming one. So he continues. Uh, Matthew does. In Matthew uh, 19 verse 7 now. They said to him, well then, why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? Didn't Moses say divorce? 
Yes. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whosoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her that is divorced commits adultery. So Jesus makes it plain. This is a very shocking teaching to those who first heard it. What he's saying is very different from the practice that we find all around us today. What is the common thought? You don't even need to get married. Just, just you know, if you, if you love somebody, that's all that counts. Marriage is just a piece of paper. Wrong. Hey, wrong. God invented marriage. He created it. And what he says is that two becoming one is only fitting in marriage. Everything else is an abuse. Everything else is sinful. Well, if you're not getting along, you just need to spit up. No. I didn't say that. The Lord who created it said that. It doesn't make a difference how many men say yes, God says no. He said, in fact, if you do that, you violate my will. You put asunder what God joined together. Now, let me tell you, you and I sitting here today, we can, all, we can all vote thumbs down on that law. It does not change an event. And we can live our lives any way we want to as long as God gives us breath. But I'll tell you, one of these days, I'm going to stand before God and answer according to his will. Not Wes's will. Not what some preacher on TV said. Not what uh, so-and-so told me. And you can read the book just like I can, and what you can find here is so shocking because it's so different to our modern thinking. Not only do you not have a right to put asunder what God joined together, but if you have the nerve to do that, and then you go out and get another, he calls that adultery. That marriage adultery. So, it's a very shocking lesson. And then he adds one more point. That if I decide to put asunder what God joined together and go over here and get another, I've committed adultery. What about that woman I put away? Well, I know this from the passage we're reading there, the last phrase, whoever marries her that's put away, they commit adultery. I add to that Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 31 and 32. This is the section, another occasion, when the Lord is, is, is making the contrast there between what they had heard and what the Lord's will was from the beginning. You've heard it said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality, if you put that woman away for any reason other than her fornication, and you, uh, 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 I'm sorry, he does not say what you might expect him to say. He doesn't say what he, he, he'd say later. He's not contrasting that. He's just different. He doesn't then go on and say, and you marry another, you commit adultery. Notice what he said. If you put that woman away for some other reason than fornication, you cause her to commit adultery. Now, I don't know about you, but when you first read that, that just takes a turn you didn't expect. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You mean this woman over here who was put away unjustly is caused to commit adultery? How do you figure that? Well, we've talked about this before, but for those who may not have thought about it before, let me offer this. Uh, yes, that's exactly what he's saying. Now, it doesn't happen automatically. It's not as if a man... And, and by the way, as far as I know, this woman may have been totally innocent. Jesus doesn't make any charge against her before she's unjustly put away. Maybe she was a great wife. And here's this evil fellow, and he goes down and puts her away. But she's caused to be an adulteress. There are some things necessarily inferred in that statement. When he uses the word adultery, that's a specific sin. It's a specific sin that involves her being uh, sexually active with someone else. She may even marry someone else. Jesus, in the last passage we looked at, talked about folks who marry those put away. And what he said is, 
that if, if she goes and gets another, and almost always that will be the case, almost always when people are put away, not always, but almost always they're going to find another. But he said, when they do, I'll tell you it's adultery. And whoever she's with is adultery. As we made the point before, maybe the person, that the fellow she finds may have never been married before. It's all adultery, God said. It, it, it violates my will. She's still bound to that man who evilly put her away. He's going to pay not only for the sin that he committed, but he's going to also pay likewise for the sin that he's caused. Now that is a very frightening statement, a sobering statement. Again, Luke chapter 16 and verse 18. How many times did the Lord repeat this law? He didn't want us to miss it. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Marries one divorced commits adultery. So, years ago in another place, we had a young couple who were coming and they wanted to talk about being members of the congregation where we were. And uh, there was a divorce involved in the situation. As I recall, the young man, uh, this was his first wife, but this was not her first husband. Well, you know, what are the circumstances? It matters. It might be right or it may not be, depending on how it meets what the Lord said. So uh, what I remember, what struck me was that as we got to talking about this, the fellow got very defensive. Maybe you can understand that, but I, we weren't trying to be mean to him. We were trying to just see if what he was doing and talking about and standing for matched the scriptures. Well, anyway, what occurred to me after a few, not, not too long after we began to discuss this, was what really aggravated him was he wasn't sure what the circumstances were. You hear what I said? I said, here's a fellow, member of the church. Uh, his dad was a preacher. Whatever that means. And he had married this young woman over here. And he didn't really know. He knew that, that she had another husband. He wasn't really sure what the circumstances were. You know, somebody in this room, God forbid, may decide to do that. I'm going to beg you not to. I'm going to beg you to know whether or not your marriage is going to be adultery. And I'm going to beg you not to cause someone that you marry and promise yourself to to commit adultery and put asunder what God joined together. Now coming back to our passage, what Paul is doing is he points back to the law that Christ gave so often and so plainly. And he said, under the married, this is verse 10, I command yet not I but the Lord let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. We, we can see, can we not, pretty clearly what he's saying there. If you make a vow, you need to keep that vow. Now the Lord gave an exception and that's right, and it's, it's, it is absolutely valid, but it is the exception. The exception was that you would put them away for the cause of their fornication. You might do that and not sin in putting them away. You might do that and have a right to another. There is an exception, Matthew 19, 9. But what's the law? In, in giving the instruction, I want to be fair enough to give all of it, but let's not lose the law. The law is what God joined together let not man put asunder. And that's what Paul points us back to here. And I make this point also as we're drawing to a close tonight because our time is about up. And uh, we're not going to finish our thoughts tonight. But anyway, let me offer this thought. When Paul wrote let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Was he giving two equal options that you can just choose which one you want? Let me say it right now. I have talked and, and talked uh, at some length with some of my brethren who believe that, you know, you can divorce your spouse as long as you don't remarry. I'm talking about a lawful spouse now. 
We're just not getting along. We have a problem, whatever it might be. We're going to divorce. Now, I know I don't have a right to marry. Let me suggest to you, if you read the scriptures, if you don't have a right to divorce your spouse, you don't have a right to remarry. And if you don't have a right to remarry, you don't have a right to divorce. They go together, as far as I can tell. Putting asunder what God joined together is in and of itself a violation of God's will. And if I've done that, and here we find Paul assuming here's a person who has done that. When he says, let them remain unmarried or be reconciled, I don't think he's saying, just whichever one you choose. Thinking about Matthew 5, thinking about the passages that we've looked at from the Lord's work, thinking about what Jesus said when he said, if you put away your spouse unjustly, you cause them to commit adultery. How could anyone think that I can make a mess like that and just say, well, it's okay. I, I, I could reconcile. I think I'll just not. When the Lord will say what you're doing is you're causing them to commit adultery. Well, somebody might ask, well, if that's the case, why is it then that uh, Paul uses the or word here? Well, my answer to that would be this. The or reminds us of the possibility that reconciliation may not be possible. Because once I put this woman away, she may not have me back. Now she's my lawful spouse and I put her away and I put her in all kind of danger, but she may not care about that. And she may not allow me to reconcile with her. And I think that's the possibility Paul is allowing for. It may be that you have to live celibate because reconciliation is not possible with this lawful spouse then, then remain unmarried. But surely if you can try to, to repair the damage that you've done that's the, the first option. Has to be. When you look at all of what is said on this subject. If I, if I miss that point I, I, I trust that you'll help me with that. But I do think that's what the text says there. If reconciliation is refused remain unmarried. But taking another would result in, a, in an adulterous union for either one. And therefore reconciliation would be the thing that we would, we would encourage and I think the scripture would demand. There's no allowance for divorcing a lawful spouse without the right granted to marry another. They're always tied together. So it's unscriptural to suppose as some have, I've heard this said, I'll divorce my husband, my wife, but I know I don't have a right to remarry. The lawful spouse now I'm talking about. The Bible teaching is don't separate what God's joined. The only exception Jesus gave to this rule includes the right to marry another. If we don't have the right to remarry, there's surely no right biblically to divorce your lawful spouse. Okay. Well, uh, boy, that's enough to get me in trouble in a lot of places. It has before. Uh, I don't, I, I, this is not the first time we've talked about it here, but anyway, there are many who will disagree with this teaching. And, and frankly, if, if it's wrong, I, I'll be glad to renounce it. But having looked at the passage and looked at, we've just looked at the first uh, 11 verses, I, I think that it'll stand. And I think that it's, it's not only um, uh, appropriate to the text, but also to other texts. And I hope and pray that you just would give it a careful consideration and then in turn help me to see if I missed the point or if, if you think I've said something out of turn. I appreciate your kind attention tonight. We will pause there. We'll hope to finish this up here uh, in the near future uh, as we look at the remaining sections here of this great chapter and try to make sure that we understand exactly what the Holy Spirit's saying. Uh, let me add this note as you take your, and turn in your songbooks. Again, Wes's teaching is not what will stand at the last day, but surely 1 Corinthians 7 is. And so let me just plead with you to whoever says it, if it's true to accept it, and not allow it to just uh, be noise but allow it to affect the decisions that we make in this vital area because they surely are vital. 
if you're here tonight, we, we, we're called to be the bride of Christ. We're called to become his. And we hope and pray that if you're here tonight and you have not answered his call to come and be one with him, that you would do that tonight. Come in faith. Come in repentance. Come and be baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Be a part of the, of the body of Christ. Be a part of the, of the church of the Lord, the bride of Christ. He invites you and we encourage you to come and let your wishes be made known. If you're here as one who has a child of God, has not been faithful to the Lord that loved you so, the promises that you've made, return to him. And if there's any way we can help you, let us know how, even right now, while we stand and sing, will you come?